Thank you for the introduction and thanks for the opportunity to talk about the work that we're doing at the University of Washington. Um, I'm a little bit of a different duck. I'm a mechanical engineer, but uh, I'm going to talk to you guys about some of the escapades we've been doing with uh, induced pluripotent stem cell uh, derived cardiomyocytes. So uh, these are my disclosures. Um, they have nothing to do with my talk today. So as, as Chuck pointed out, there's a lot of potential for stem cell-derived cardiomyocytes. Um, they can heal the heart, but you can also use them for studying disease, new drug therapies, or even how the heart forms and what are the factors that go into healthy heart development. Um, I'm not going to introduce too much about the process of making induced pluripotent stem cells, but suffice to say you can take cells from an adult, activate some transcription factors, and then lead them on a pathway towards cardiomyocyte differentiation. Now, in the dish, these cells begin to beat, have the structures of cardiomyocytes and some of the um, electrical calcium handling, but they still have some shortcomings. They're, they're not exactly like the adult cells. Um, they're a little bit deficient in terms of what isoforms they're expressing, as Chuck alluded to in his talk, uh, some of the electrical um, processes are off, and we need to improve these. If we really want them to be used as these sort of in vitro models of disease, so that disease in a dish, if you will, or looking for new pharmaceutical compounds, they need to be more like the adult type. So we have to have some new approaches that will allow us to reach the potential of these cells. So where's our limits? Well, one thing is that how we are working with these cells is a limit. So what we are using are these flat plastic tissue culture dishes, and what we really want is something more like the in vivo environment, but there's not a lot of hearts running around that we can use for our work. Um, so, and there's some disadvantages, you know, the, the, the hearts are low throughput, um, but they have dynamic, uh, they're beating, they generate force. They're a soft material, so there's a lot of differences between what the natural environment is like versus what we're using for our experiments. So what are ways that we can be doing better in vitro techniques? And where my lab has been interested is in more of the functional assessment. If you really want to know if the heart is working well, you measure its ejection fraction. You see how well it beats. Well, what's the in vitro counterpart to that with these cardiomyocytes? It's the force they generate. So really, to see how mature these cells are, you want to see how strong they are. So in order to do that in an in vitro environment, we've been developing techniques that we've done before for non-cardiomyocytes to measure their force. So these are single cell assays of measuring the forces that cells generate when they contract or migrate. And so for cardiomyocytes, these are, these are a good environment to start to study them at the single cell level. So these are microposts, which you're seeing over here, these little chips that you can stick into a tissue culture dish. And each little square here has 100,000 small pillars looking back at you. And so under an SCM, you can see that these silicone pillars are around 3 microns in diameter, 10 microns tall, and you can culture cells on the tips of these pillars. So over, shown over here is a cardiomyocyte that's generating, you can see it's sarcomeres. And what you can also maybe pick up is that the normal position for all these pillars is a orthogonal kind of rows and columns, but some of these are actually being bent. They're being pulled on by the cardiomyocytes. And so you can measure how much force there is by tracking how much deflection you see in these pillars, and this is compatible with, you know, confocal or optical microscopy. And so being a mechanical engineer, this is an easy problem. The amount of force that you're generating here by a cell is proportional to how much you see it bend. This is really your spring equation or Hooke's law from physics. So based upon the elasticity of the material, the diameter, and the height, you can then figure out how much force there is based upon how much deflection you have. So how do you make these? Well, the same way you make a computer chip or your cell phone, you use semiconductor technology. You can 
take a silicon wafer and use photolithography to create these original structures in photoresist. So this is just using light and a, a photo mask. You can create these rigid structures. But that takes a lot of effort. So you don't want to just use that for yourselves. You want to create many copies of that. And so one way we can do that is to use a casting process called soft lithography, where you're using a wonder material called PDMS, or Silgard 184, which is uh, quite common nowadays, but you're creating a negative mold of those original structures. And then you can use that mold to pour in some more PDMS, cook it, and now you have a, a copy of your original uh, array of pillars, but now it's silicone, it's transparent, you can functionalize it with proteins, and so you can grow your cells on this. And what's nice is through this process, I can create thousands to tens of thousands of copies from an original master. So it has pr very nice fidelity down to the nanoscale in these dimensions. So to get the cells to stick, you have to put some protein down. And this is similar to when maybe you were kids, you took those rubber stamps and were sticking ink onto paper. It's a similar technique where we can take uh, an ink filled with extracellular matrix protein, whether it be laminin, fibronectin, collagen, and you're gonna get the protein to stick onto the stamp through hydrophobic interactions. And now you've got this stamped inked, you can then bring it into contact with the tips of your silicone posts, and the protein will transfer across through hydrophobic, hydrophilic interactions. Now, you want to then block any additional protein from sticking using um, pleuronic, which is like PEG. And so now you can seed your cells on top of the tips of these pillars, and you can measure how much force they generate. So what does it look like? Well, under a phase microscope, you can do some high-speed imaging, and you can track as this single cardiomyocyte beats on the microposts. And you can track how much force is being generated by tracking how much deflection you see. So shown over here, you can track the position of each of these pillars over time. And so if you know its deflection, you can then calculate the force based upon that spring constant for that relationship. But you can even go a little further. You can get into some more kinetics or look at the velocity of how much force, or the velocity of this movement or force times velocity gives you the power. And so you can also see how strong your cells are. So now you've got a way of looking at the strength of individual cardiomyocytes, and you've got a way to start to assess different ways of maturing them. So through collaborators at the University of Washington, we were using these microposts as a functional assessment for different maturation protocols that were being developed. With Chuck, we were looking at a thyroid hormone, T3, which in vitro we saw that was causing the cells to increase in size, have better looking sarcomeres, but it, it may look like a cardiomyocyte, it may have the proteins of a cardiomyocyte, but if you really want to see if it's a good cardiomyocyte, you want to see if it beats. And so we can actually measure how much force is being generated over time, and we saw that this T3 treatment did increase the contractility of these cells. So we're getting them closer to being like the adult cardiomyocytes, but we're not there yet. Um, with Hanella Ruhala Baker at University of Washington, she's been looking at different microRNA that can be used to mature cardiomyocytes. And through a large screen, she saw that LET7 was highly abundant in very mature stem cell derived cardiomyocytes. And so she used overexpression of this. And so now with this microRNA, you're seeing much larger cardiomyocytes. And again, their forces were much higher with this uh, overexpression of miRNA. Now that's just for maturation, but you could also use this for modeling disease in the dish. So when you're looking at dilated cardiomyopathy, uh, the most common um, mutation associated with that is a truncation of titan. So with Chuck and uh, Mike Rainier, we've been looking at a CRISPR-Cas9 version of a truncated titan uh, isoform. And titan is a sarcomeric protein that kind of helps put together the contractile apparatus. And what was interesting is that um, the, a mutation that, at the, that binds to the Z-disc over here was still able to generate uh, sarcomeres, but these were much weaker structures. So compared to the wild type here, the force is much weaker, and so we're seeing much lower twitch forces. And I'm going to come back to this story again later on, but this is one way of kind of looking at the mechanism and what the actual action is from uh, different kinds of mutations and disease.
Now with Kanwha Song at the University of um, uh, Colorado in Denver, we've been looking at Dannon disease, which is a, um, another cardiomyopathy in uh, young adults. Uh, he's been looking at how it relates to LAMP2, which is an, which is an autophagy type pathway. And so when you have these stem cell derived cardiomyocytes from these actual children, you can then generate your own IPS lines from that and turn them into cardiomyocytes. And so when you look at your normal IPS cardiomyocytes versus these Dannon disease uh, derived from patients with Dannon disease, you're seeing much larger cardiomyocytes here, but the forces are, are significantly reduced. So looking over here with the LAMP2 knockout versus all of these Dannon patient lines, we're seeing much lower forces in these individuals, um, mostly through their metabolic and um, um, uh, their uh, autophagy pathways. So this is just sort of a snapshot of using these 2D approaches, but that's not like the actual heart. And so there's lots of effort to go into these 3D approaches. So um, when you're looking at cells in a dish, you're looking at flat cells on a planar substrate that's, again, rigid. But it's very high throughput. You can have high automation or an army of technicians feeding your cells. Um, but they're very robust assays that are available. But on the 3D side, we're still developing these. So cells in gels are round, they're not flat, but these techniques are not as high throughput, and we don't really have as many tools as we've had with our in vitro culture. So there's been a large push for more 3D uh, type approaches, these organoids, and so in some sense, people think that these are gonna revolutionize the world, and so we expect amazing things like 3D glasses had, had showed at the time, but um, let's put a little bit of a, um, um, some context in this, because what were the movies that they were watching at that time? They were excellent movies, weren't they? <laughs> so we're not there yet, but we will be getting there. So right now we're looking at men in rubber masks, and soon hopefully we'll be creating much better uh, tissues or tissue organoids. And so one of the tissue organoids that we're developing are these engineered heart tissues. So these are these three-dimensional organoids that we're using these stem cell-derived cardiomyocytes for. And instead of growing an individual cell on an array of posts, we're growing half a million cells between two posts. So these are really more like heart strings. And they beat and generate force. And we can see how much force there is by how much they bend their pillars. And this gives them a more three-dimensional environment because opposed to being like those sort of smaller cardiomyocytes, we're seeing them link up forming connections between each other and looking a bit more like the actual histology that you would see from an adult heart, uh, heart tissue. Uh, we still don't have high enough density. There's ways of trying to make this to be more meaty, which is what we're trying to do in the lab. So how do we get there? We still use silicone to make our pillars, but this time we're using uh, a four-part mold over here that we can cast our arrays into. And now we've got this array of pillars that you can then stick into a mold of agros, which is a preform for the heart tissues. So you can cast about a half a million stem cell derived cardiomyocytes. You throw in about 10% stromal cells that help the matrix uh, get compacted down. And here we're using fibrin gel. Um, similar to uh, Dr. Suggs, but not the pegylation to it. But, or you can try other uh, matrix gel compounds as well. And so initially these cells are sitting around inside jelly, or jello if you will, and then within a few hours they begin to compact and form a tissue. And within about a week they begin to beat visibly. So you can do these within 24 wells. And what you're seeing over here are 12 little heart, heart strings all beating to their own drummer. So this is one way of, oh, play it one more time, there we go, oops. So um, how do you analyze this? Well, again, just using microscopy, we can track the movement of one of those pillars, one of those posts over time. So one of them is flexible, and it has a magnet inside of it, which I'll, I'll get to that in a second. The other one we've made rigid by embedding a glass rod on the inside. And again, we can see how much force there is by how much it bends the pillar using a spring equation. And 
These tissues will follow our electrical pacing. We can track the movement over here. And normally, you might have a spontaneous beating at around between 1 and 1.5 hertz. But if you start to increase that frequency, they begin to follow along um, and increase their frequency to match. Now, optical measurements allows you to look at only one tissue at a time, which we do use this a lot. But what we've been developing is a little bit more high throughput approach. And instead of actually using optics, we're going to use magnetics. So that magnet that I talked about that we've embedded in there, that actually gives us a little signal to track. So we can use what's called a giant magnoresistive sensor. This is just a really great magnetic detector. And so as that pillar moves, it changes the magnetic field at that detector. And so now you've got an electrical way of measuring how much force is generated by these tissues. So it gives you a real-time measurement. And instead of occupying a single microscope, you could listen to uh, 24 tissues at one time in the incubator. And you can do this sort of in parallel. So it has that potential for high throughput uh, assays. So shown down here are some printed circuit boards with those GMR sensors underneath. So kind of a proof of concept, we were doing this with some pharmacological testing that's been known to cause different effects on cardiomyocytes. So shown over here is the data that we would get from a control sample, where here we just injected a sham, which is just, uh, I believe, water. And we got all these different beats. So you can kind of zoom in over region D over here. You can see the beats over time and the force. Likewise, down here, you see the same thing. Now, if you add verapamil, which is an L-type calcium channel blocker, you're going to cause the tissues to stop beating. And again, when we do this, we see that the beats stop over time. Or if you add isoproternol, which is a beta-adrenetic stimulator, you actually get more like the adrenaline shot, and you see an increase in frequency over time in response to that. So you can imagine screening through different compounds and whether they create maybe cardiotoxicity or maybe actual cardiology drugs of your own choice. Now, to make these tissues more mature, we've been looking to see what happens in development. And one thing that happens is the heart has to work harder during development. So the afterload increases. The amount of pressure the heart has to pump against, against will rise over weeks of development. So shown here are some data for uh, a fetus at 10 weeks to 40 weeks. You see a rise in the amount of systolic blood pressure. And that's what the tissue, that's what the heart has to pump against. Now in vitro, we don't really exercise these cells, but we can. We can start using these braces here that you can snap on and by putting a brace on here, you're effectively shortening the length of these pillars. And by shortening the length, you've increased the stiffness. Over here is a very easy pillar to bend. But over here, this is near isometric conditions, making it very hard for these tissues to pull against. So shown over here are some graphs of just how that changes the stiffness of these pillars over time. So when we use these braces, we saw that as we used a stiffer and stiffer environment, we saw less deflection out of those tissues. But the force was actually higher. Because that tissue was much, was, that post was much stiffer, based upon its spring constant, we saw a high twitch force. We saw a lower velocity here in yellow and a little bit less power at that really high stiffness, that near isometric state. But if you backed off and looked at more of the intermediate stiffnesses like K2 or K3, you lose a bit of deflection. You lose a little bit of force, but in some cases not as much. You gain some more velocity, and you gain power out of the tissue. So it's helping to mature the amount of contractile work that these cells can generate. Shown down here are some of the numbers for the fact that these tissues had a, a larger resting length on the stiffer uh, pillars. This is just a measurement of how much force is being generated, shown above. And this is, again, this the velocity and the power from the data I was showing you above. So this is showing that they're getting stronger, but why is that? Well, this afterload is helping them mature. Um, what we saw is that they started to express different markers of more cardiac uh, protein isoforms or protein levels. So 
Shown over here is alpha myosin, and we see it going down, which is what we want to see within developing heart tissue. We see um, beta myosin over here, MYH7 increase. And so if you actually skip over here to comparison, uh, this is the levels if you compare it to actual fetal tissue. We see that even on that stiffest environment, K4, we're seeing a reduction in alpha myosin, but we're not getting to those fetal levels yet. And while over here, MYH7, we are also sort of in between. So compared to when we first used those cells in day one versus the stiffening environment, we're seeing an improvement, but we still have to reach out and go further in our maturation. Now, along the way, we're seeing some um, upregulation of myosin regulatory light chain over here. We're seeing uh, cardiac actin going up, as well as uh, troponin I for the cardiac isoform. And this is one of my interesting uh, proteins over here. This is uh, melucin, which is potentially has a role in mechanotransduction. But not all markers are going up, shown down here as well, and it's not just with, you know, the RNA levels there. You actually see it at the protein level, too. You see an increase in that ratio between alpha and beta myosin. Now, along with this, we start to see some hypertrophy, and some of it's a little bit pathological. So, um, there are some different markers over here that are indicators of pathological hypertrophy or changes in metabolism, and even a little bit of fibrosis over here. But we're not yet seeing it at the tissue level. So if we actually look to see uh, the passive force versus stretching these tissues, we don't see much difference. So they don't really seem to be stiffen stiffened or more fibrotic. And so shown over here is the effective stiffness of these tissues at the different um, environmental or the afterload conditions that we're giving them. Now, when you're maturing these tissues, you also want to use them. And so one way of doing that is for disease modeling. So going back to that Titan truncation over here, we're seeing actually with that uh, TNTZ null over here, a much lower force in these tissues because before we were seeing a reduction at the single cell level. Here we're seeing a much greater response because you're looking at a half a million cells all working together. So you're kind of amplifying any changes and looking at it more like a, you would a tissue. Or uh, with David Mack, we've been looking at uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy and using patient-derived DMD cells, we see a reduction in twitch force over here. And we're also starting to see beat irregularities within these tissues as well. So this is just a starting point here, but we're really excited to see uh, where we go with this. So what I talked to you guys about are these new tools that we're developing to kind of help us unlock the potential of these stem cell derived cardiomyocytes so they could be used in uh, drug screening, disease modeling, heart regeneration, or, or even uh, developmental biology. And you know, we have a 2D approach with our microprost arrays that could be used to uh, validate maturation protocols that we've been developing or even do disease modeling like um, you know, titan associated mutations di in dilated cardiomyopathy or Denon disease. But we're also now working towards more high throughput 3D approaches with these engineered heart tissues. Um, again, using those magnetic sensing, we can now track the motion and the strength of many tissues at one time. And we can start to look at ways of how the heart develops, what's the role of the mechanotransduction of afterload as these tissues have to work harder and harder. And also, again, do disease modeling in a dish of many different types, Duchenne muscular dystrophy or, again, uh, dilated cardiomyopathy. So I just want to acknowledge some of the great students that have been in my lab. Um, Marita, Kevin, Andrea, and uh, Kevin too, as we call him as well. Um, but also, I think part of this work has been really fantastic from the collaborators here at the University of Washington, as well as those um, across the country. So I'd just like to thank uh, Chuck, Hanella, Mike, Kanwa, and David as well for their um, great positive interactions and re really great ways to help push the engineering and the science forward. And uh, thank you guys.